Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you about an item which I know from Anna Henningsen who had the idea that I come here to talk about microbiology. You are probably familiar with or not, less or more. So I jump into cold water not knowing what's your background in this field, which is a specific one on the one side. On the other hand, it has simply to do with water, humidity and care. So I will try to explain to you how biodeterioration processes will interfere with materials in conservation science. I will give you some evaluation of the impacts. I will talk about risk factors very clearly what kind of factors influence these processes. I will give you some case studies. Uh, excuse me that I give you very, very famous places I talk about. I prefer normally the smaller ones, but in the bigger ones, you get the money to do analysis. And at the end of all these things, I would like to see that you go out and you know that it's not always analysis which counts, it's thinking. Thinking about the problem, it's not only the measurement. But nevertheless, all these cases gave me the opportunity to find out how important it is to think about problems and not to act simply as I think from the bottom of my heart. I have to give you an idea on the effective control. And at the end, also, I want to talk about further perspectives, which is for me essential when you have a meeting like here. I want to give you some ideas for the discussion later, what you, how you want to deal with biodeterioration problems. Biodeterioration seems to us, when we are in, a different, in one climate, in a particular climate, then we have an idea of biodeterioration. But worldwide seen, biodeterioration is very different. When you look at stone at the Cathedral of Cologne, you have the implementation also of, of atmospheric pollution. This influences biodeterioration. Biodeterioration accelerates those damage functions. On the other hand, you have climates in the Mediterranean area, you have less water. You have different climate in comparison to the moderate climate in, in Germany. You have in Brazil, you have sunlight. You have different organisms there. Some organisms do not like this kind of sunlight. They live underneath the surface. They do not live on the surface in those areas. And finally, in Angkor Wat, where we're studying now biodeterioration for nearly now 15 years, we know that the organism can somehow be protective, but this I will explain to you later on. So, biological impacts on stone are not always the same. We have to consider it and we have to do it in particular cases. We have to look for them and to analyze. Also, this is in different environments, whether you look for archives or you look for excavation. The situations are different. This is a wet environment. This should be a dry environment, but it isn't. It's a dusty environment, sometimes very humid. We have churches where we have wall paintings, which normally they do not face any problems for many, many years. But suddenly, we go and restore these churches, which we come across these problems very often. The people paint the walls, which are not decorated, and they paint the walls with polymeric paints. And what do they do? What do they, do? They, they, they close the surface so that the humidity cannot be absorbed anymore, and the humidity goes into the wall painting, not thinking about consequences of their doing. So it's not only looking for the wall painting, it's always looking for the whole system and analyzing what's going on here, what did we change, what kind of parameters did we change. It was the same with the terracotta army, I come to you later, where it is the question of ventilation, of movement of air, and as well that we have to consider that artifacts coming from those archaeological sites, when they come into air, the conditions change again. So what we are doing, we always have to think beforehand and not to act, and then we see the mold, we see the bacteria, we see the algae, we have to act before. So what kind of organism? I do not want to go too deep into, uh, it will be not a lecture for students, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's uh, important to know what kind of organism we talk about. We talk in the first instance about algae doing photosynthesis, cyanobacteria, living on walls, 
at the outside, they are mostly the pioneers. They don't need any other supplements, no nutrients. They need sunlight, CO2 and water. On these algae, then we have fungi growing because they need the biomass produced by the organism or the fungi use all the kind of consolidants and all the, pigment and all the polymers we apply to surfaces. Fungi are very adaptable. They have a wide range of moisture, of humidity they can live on from 55, from 60 up to 95% relative humidity. And those guys, they react immediately if you put a nutrient to, a, to an environment where it, is, uh, where it is metabolized by the organism and you should be careful what kind of consolidant, what kind of material you put on your artifact. When those both organisms come together, they form the lichen. Lichen is a symbiosis of the fungi and the algae. And it's very common on stones. People don't like it because of an aesthetical uh, defacement of a surface. I like them because they give you a hint that the air is very clean in the environment and there's somehow a hydrophobic coating for the surface. Be careful removing lichens. But I will explain to you later on in a case study. We have in the wet environments, we have bacteria and actinomyces. But for those organisms, you need a lot of water. So this kind of excavation I showed to you in Denmark, in Udamose, you need a lot of water and then you have to deal with bacteria. But bacteria are not there when you have only a high humidity. That's not enough for them. They need soil. They really need a wet environment. And that's also mostly with anaerobic microorganisms, like in this excavation in China, where you could see that this kind of crust formation was formed by disulfuricans. These are organisms using sulfate, uh, and they are producing acids and corrode materials. So these are the microorganisms, just to give you a short overview. And what are they doing? The first thing is an aesthetical damage. Here shown at the glass window, uh, and in these glasses you see a brownish layer. And these brownish, brown, uh, brownish pigments, they can be also derived from chemical reaction, but we also know from a research project that there are microorganisms, specific bacteria involved in those uh, defacement and such color, uh, discoloration. We have biocorrosion. So production of acids by organism, which can cause on the surface, to some extent, a deterioration of the surface. But it takes a long, long time. And I have figured out, I did my PhD thesis about it, and I got a bit bored about the very slow process of biocorrosion. I was much more interested in biofouling, because the organisms, they grow on the surface in a so-called biofilm. And the biofilm, it changes the behavior of the material. So a material which has been hydrophobic can be changed by biofilms into hydrophilic. So they change their environment. And these biofouling processes, they are much more important to my opinion. And that is the reason why you have to analyze biofilm, why we have to analyze infection on materials. How do they interfere with the material? Is it protective or is it really deteriorating? And last not least, people working in archives they have also fear because of impact to health, especially because of fungi, mold spores. And I, can, I agree with people working all the time with those material, mold infested material, they are really a bit in danger and they have to be careful with it. But not in every archive I go into which is molded, this is an impact to health. In the moment I move those items, then it gets a problem normally not in a stored archive. So we have to differentiate the situation, how we are exposed to those uh, micro, um, uh, fungal spores, which can have an impact on our health. Nevertheless, if we see all these impacts, biocorrosion, biofouling, they have to be quantified. I have learned from all my colleagues, which all discussed with me all these years, what are these microorganisms doing? So I went out with people like here in, uh, with Eva Adventa in, in Brazil. We did measurements. 
We did capillary water uptake measurements. We did uh, tension measurements. And we found out that certain biofilms really have an, have an impact. They change uh, materials. They have this hydrophilic effect. The deposition of our aerosols in is enhanced by the biofilm. So even if the microorganisms do not deteriorate a surface, they enhance the, bio, the, the corrosion process on a surface and they enhance capillary water uptake. And also, what I've already said is biocorrosion. They can corrode a surface, and this can be measured even by uh, losing the strength of the material. But it is necessarily needed to make an analysis like this. Not all the lichens you see on a surface, whether in Sweden or whether in Italy, whether in Turkey or whether in, in Cambodia, be careful in judging this as a deteriorating factor. You have to look what kind of stone it is. You have to look essentially how long does this process take. And I will show this later on the case study of Angkor. So what are the risk factors we have with biodeterioration processes? One is clear, it's moisture, humidity. Without moisture, humidity, there's no microbiology possible. We have some adaptation organisms which is low relative humidity to grow, as I said already, for the fungi, for the mold. But nevertheless, we need all kinds of these risk factors analyzed when we look for a problem which is concerned in biodeterioration. Moisture and humidity. But this alone is not a factor enough. We have to see where is the water stored? How is the water supplied to the organism? So in this case, it is important to see the material properties. I already said, when I paint a church wall with this Persian paint, I close it. The water cannot go into the wall again. It goes to the next part. It goes to the wall painting, which is still in the original status and is open for water. So if the material surface is open for the water, it can absorb. If I close it, I lose surface, which can balance the humidity. So material properties around a place which is humid plays a very important role. Nutrients play an important role. Sometimes we apply materials in conservation not knowing whether they are sensitive to microbial uh, impact, to, micro to microbes. Microbes like all kinds of polymeric substances, more or less. This needs to be tested, and it's never been tested, especially important in environments which have enough moisture and humidity. And last but not least, we have to look where do the organisms come from. Most of the organisms, they're everywhere around. You have fungal spores on your clothes, on your food, everywhere. But as long as there is no water, nothing will happen. But if there are too much spores around the place, then the pressure in the environment is too high and it gives the organism the opportunity to grow in this environment. So these are the risk factors. Seems to be simple, seems to be understandable, but it's not so easy all the time. Moisture. What kind of level moisture do you expect? We say normally 65. That's a good relative humidity for an environment. But I said already to you, it can be 60 enough for fungi. At 95, how do you deal with churches with 90%? I learned from Tim Patfield once very interesting things. He was a conservator in Denmark, in Copenhagen, who told me, who told you that when you measure in a room a relative humidity, whether this is for the whole room? No, they are in the corners, they are different values. You have to see that you have to move the air in order to mixture it. You should not go into a room and measure simply. So I get the idea of ventilation. Ventilation is one tool, even in churches with high humidity, to lower biodeterioration processes. Because the fungus does not like this air movement, it tries out on the surface. It does not catch the humidity, even if it's on a high level in the atmosphere. So we have to, to deal with the distribution of humidity. And another important factor is Again, coming back to the churches, we have to look whether we have a mortar system, for example, calcareous mortar, as a fancy stuff in order to store humidity in a building. We always use these dispersion paints. I hate them. 
I mentioned it now third, three times. And you can see that a lot of deteriorated cases on, with biodeterioration, we have seen that closing down the surface and not using materials which absorb humidity, they kill the environment and they make it microorganism easy to penetrate into materials they would never do if we give, wouldn't give them the chance to reach the humidity. So we have two, I have two examples in the, in the next in order to show you how can you deal with it. Once people look at churches in France and then they can see that they have a big problem with humidity. Humidity come up the walls inside, you have algal growth and you have deterioration on the wall paintings and as well on the glass windows. Okay, other people say you have to climatize, you have to have invent a, clean, a heating system. Next example is in Germany. We have in Germany now the problem with heating system. Why? Because heating system causes a lot of dust. The dust goes around to the wall paintings, it goes into the orcs, and dust is this nutrient. And nutrient again favors the growth of fungal spores. And now we have a fungal infestation in these heated churches. Because we always think black and white. We have to think a bit more in particular. We have to know about what do we change and what do we need to change. We have to get rid of water, but do we really need to heat and to try out an environment? We should be careful in doing that. These are both problems we are aware as consultant in conservation science. We have to learn to make an approach much more multidisciplinary in order to evaluate biodeterioration. And you see in this graph that microbiology is, is the last you have to do. People always start or mostly start when they are facing a problem with biodeterioration, with microorganism. They want to know what kind of microorganism. Uh, is it dangerous? And uh, they, they start with a biological analysis. And I can tell you this is wrong. You have to first to start with the object. You have to understand the object, the history of the object, the construction, the materials. You have to know what's going around. And then you have an objective. Where do I want to go? And this is also for the microbiologist at the end is important. It's not only simply analyzing organism and knowing the names of the organism and knowing what they're doing. It's the whole system you have to analyze. You have to get an idea on this damage situation, on temperature, humidity. And in the final, then you have to get an evaluation of the endangerment by microorganism. And this can be simply done by observation, microscopy. It's not so the, the necessary to use all this fancy stuff we have today in molecular techniques and so on. These are fine for us as scientists, but mostly it's spending a lot of money for nothing. Multidisciplinary approach, this is important. And I will show you some case studies in this regard in order to give you an idea what I mean with it. I'm working since 15 years now, in uh, 15 years in Cambodia. And all the people were aware of the deterioration I already showed you, by corrosion of the stone, the very sensitive stone. The stone is covered by these lichens. We have also iron uh, attack by microorganism, by bacteria, and we also have plaster, which is attacked by the organism. No doubt, there's biodeterioration. But when you look careful to the temples which have not been touched by human beings so far, you see that there's an ecology. You have organisms which have limits. There's the white lichen, the black one, the green ones. They have different areas where they grow. It's a microbial ecology. They are dependent on each other. They keep their borders, yeah? And when you, when you see that there is a protection by the trees keeping the humidity level very, very uh, stable. And you can also see that where water is flowing down, you have green algae, and where's water less, you have red algae, which is important for us to see. This is a, an algae called Trentopolia, which prefers lower levels of, uh, of um, humidity, of moisture. This is the ecology. But now people came in the 90s, Indians, and cleaned the temple. It was white. Great doing. The lichens were removed, but by time, 
the temple started to blacken because one, like one cyanobacteria, Gluocapsa, which is a black one, was starting to cover the whole stone because it has an advantage. It has no competitors anymore. So it blackens the whole stone. And what does it mean in Cambodia? The thermal hygienic stress for this clay-containing material increased. And now we do not talk about biocorrosion of one millimeter per 100 years, or maybe in 50 years. We talk now about centimeters, which were degraded because shales were moved up because of the heating up of the thermal absorption of the stone. They were detached from the surface and you were losing all the original surface after cleaning. It might be an extreme example, but it should give you, should remind you all the time when you go again for a surface on a facade and going to clean it, ask yourself why you're doing it and whether it's a good idea in doing it. These organisms, we have learned, they are protective in the area, and I fight for this in Cambodia since years, that they are not going to clean everywhere where they want. Another fascinating thing which came across, I talked about the Strentopolia, which prefers low levels of moisture. Here they applied a hydrophobic consolidant on the surface, and it turned red, because the algae immediately went to the hydrophobic surface. So it was not a red because of chemical conversion, it was a biological uh, coloration of the hydrophobic surface. In the terracotta army, it was the same thing. People thought about the problem of mold. Mold is eating up the terracotta army. And the only thing what happened is they closed the house and they removed and they, they uh, did not enable the excavation to try out. The ventilation was quite zero. That was the reason why mold growth grew on these surfaces. And the only thing in order to get rid of the mold was to ventilate the excavation. And we did a biocide treatment uh, area which disappeared after one year ventilating the whole hall. So the biocide were not any more useful, uh, they were any more necessary to be considered because only the ventilation was enough in order to get control in the biodeterioration. The same thing happens in Lascaux. In Lascaux, there was a chimney effect in regulating the humidity on these wall paintings. And you know that was for 18,000 years, it was stable environment. But then they closed the door, they invented an air ventilation system, which was in the beginning very simple, very well balanced with the environment. But then in 2000, they implemented a high technical device. And after this, we had mold growth on the surface. And nowadays, we are fighting those molds. Nevertheless, when I was consultant in this field, I said, ventilate again, move the air like it was in the beginning. And they did it in the past, and I've heard in spring that the, uh, that the fungal infestation is decreasing again, and it gets under control. So it's sometimes the very simple things to consider and not to do with great intervention, something against microorganism. And it always has to be done by multidisciplinary approaches, interdisciplinary work, otherwise we will not find out a way. With the wall paintings, I finally want to just give an idea that using polymeric substances can increase also problems on wall paintings, not only the missing absorption of surfaces for humidity, uh, but also the implementation of polymeric coatings can cause biodeterioration problems. And then the excavation here in Nydamosa, I already talked about this, uh, this project. We were, had the task to make measurements in an in situ preservation project. The question was, what if we do not dig out this kind of materials out of the, of the uh, water here, will something happen because of biodeterioration impacts? And we measured here uh, the uh, sulfate uh, content of the, of the uh, bottom we, uh, of, of the soil. We looked for the waters, we looked for the reduction uh, redox potential, and we found out, no, there is no endangerment, so you can keep it for a certain time here. So also microbiology can give you some advice how you can keep those areas, those excavations for a longer time. 
In other cases, we could show that classes, archaeological classes, when you take them out of the soil, then you have the problem that these classes will turn into a biological disaster. And you can see it in fluorescent microscopy that these classes, which have been digged inside the soil, nothing happened in biology, but in the moment it comes to the oxygen, it comes into the atmosphere, it changes completely and deterioration occurred immediately. So when you do things like this, whether it's metal or whether it's glass in excavation, think about how you deal with these objects in the later. If you do not have an idea, keep them where they are and do not change the environmental conditions. Because it has always consequences when you dig out things and whether you do in any kind of interventions. You change the radar conditions, you give oxygen, you give humidity, you give nutrients, and you give organisms from the outside into the system. One big example for that is the fungus in the grave of Tudench Amun. Everybody thinks that the Egyptians have put the organisms there in order to punish people which opened the grave. This is not true. They put in the archaeologists. They brought in the organism and gave them a chance to grow there. That was the problem, because no organism, no fungus can survive for 2,500 years. This is a fairy tale, but it's not true. So, we are activating those microbial processes, and so we should be careful in what we're doing when we attract monuments in museums, archives, anything we are going to touch. It has its consequences. So, what can we do? Essentially, for me, it is entire anamnesis of all the physical and chemical damage functions. For me, I can say, I always, as a consultant lab, I prefer not to do analysis, I prefer in museums and archives the so-called one-day service. We come for one day, we have a look for the, for the museum, for the archive, for the monument, in order to get a first idea and approach and to discuss with people and not to start with analysis. Analysis costs a lot of money, costs time, but gives you no solution. But talking together, it gives you a solution. Whether disinfection makes sense, what kind of material can be applied, what kind of, con of, uh, of um, additives can be used, what kind of surface protectives can be used, and how can these Implemented with biocide treatment. Is a biocide treatment necessary? I know a lot of people say, do you have a biocide? I know all the restorers, they have their, I have something I can put on the wall and then they are dead. I know, there are a lot of substances on the market, but it is a question whether it's necessary to apply. If you understand the whole process, normally you do not need biocide. The only thing I used in the past biocide was once in Lascaux because the mold infestation was so harsh and so, so uh, hard that we said we have once to treat it but afterwards we have to improve the climate. Biocide treatment is never a solution but it has to be always integrated into a system. And the last point, however, it is the smallest point is maintenance and care. We cannot do things, we cannot do recommendations which last for 10 or 20 years. We have to give people an idea how to maintain the situation after our consultancy, after the improvement we did, in order to give them more idea how to care for their particular monument they are responsible for. I come to one point so I have also a small model with me, and I was impressed because it's coming from washing industry. It's from Henkel, Düsseldorf. And they said, I did a, bit, I did a translation into our field. And I said, okay, we have in this pie chart, we have biocide treatment, cleaning, so mechanical cleaning, repetition, and climate. And sometimes maybe we say the climate we cannot control, it's wet. Okay, in this case, probably I have to increase the amount of biocide. Or I can increase the cleaning, but cleaning means mechanical treatment, means loss of original material. But always it comes to the sum of 100. So I have always to think about what part of this chart I prefer, if I prefer the repetition, if I have the time, if it's a small item I can have to treat, I can do that. 
or I use a biocide, it's easier, which I would not prefer because biocides in the later they turn on to get mineralized and serve as nutrients to the microorganisms. So how can we make an approach in a better way? And this is something which I think is important. However, it's a quite theoretical basis, but it gives you an idea. What can I do? Where can I change in my particular case to, uh, in order to get the best solution? So in future perspectives, I would like to say it's one of the most important points I added in the morning. In the interdisciplinary risk analysis, before conservation intervention, think. Before you act, think about it. And not only simple clean, not only think about, I uh, make an analysis, think about what I can do. Have an attention for microbial influences, whether it's on monuments, museums and archives and so on. They are microbes and they play an important role. Sometimes you don't see them, that's the nature of microorganisms. Sometimes you can see them like algae or mold growth. For me, most important is that we have to preserve the environmental conditions, or if we have to change them, then very carefully in order to keep the balance. Think about the small explanation I could not go too deep into in Lascaux. They did a deep intervention, and this way they have caused a real disaster. And we are happy, after all, that we could bring it back into the old situation like it was nearly before. And all the kind of interventions and countermeasure, they should implement not only biological, but also physical and chemical uh, 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 factors which can be used in, in order to get rid of biodeterioration uh, processes. And then the final, after I've talked so much about uh, the deterioration of microorganisms, I would like to say a bit about future activities we do, we use organisms nowadays in order to restore surfaces. The one thing is the use of disulfuricants, which are organisms which uh, live on sulfate, sulfate crusts, and which are turning the sulfate into carbonate, and we are applying this now, next year, I hope, in Bulgaria, to the rider of Madara, which has a lot of problems with gypsum. And in order to remove the gypsum, not chemically, we use this biological technique. And another thing is, is biocalcite bacteria. A lot of bacteria, they produce biocalcite in order to protect surfaces. And this biocalcite, you can see here in an electronic microscopy uh, analysis, you can see is covering the surface, but it is not really covering, it has a network, so it is an open system, it is not closed. And we are doing now uh, a research with Turkey together, whether we can preserve, whether we can conserve wall paintings or stones, crumbling stones, mm -hmm. with this kind of technique in order to like consolidation, the biological consolidation of surfaces. So at the end, you should not only think after my talk that biodeterioration is always a deteriorating process, we can also use microorganisms for the purpose to help us in preserving our cultural heritage. Thank you very much for your attention. Wait, wait, wait.